opinions expressed in this show are solely the opinions of the speaker and do not reflect the opinion of RFR or any affiliates. Radio Free Radio. Radio Free Radio. Radio Free Radio. What is reality? Reality is what we believe to be true about the nature of our surroundings. But how do we come to decide that true nature? Do we conceive it completely on our own? Or do other devices gently sway our thoughts onto a pre-decided path? This is the hard question we must all ask ourselves as free humans on this planet. New skulls your reality. Reality. Hey guys, it's another wonderful Wednesday night here at the Super Secret Undisclosed location. Uh, it's time for your reality brief. We got a pretty uh, good show lined up for you tonight. We got a uh, special guest. Um, you've heard us talk about the Secret Space Program. We've even talked about her on the show. Uh, it's Ileana, and uh, she was in the ICC, among other things, in the SSP for about 60 years was her total time so i'll go ahead and uh bring her in for you guys and just say all right look at me i can do all the fancy stuff hello <laughs> thanks for uh joining us on the show tonight how's it going oh pretty good thank you it's good to be here awesome thanks for coming on uh, thank you i'm still trying to get you <laughs> hey look at that Hey, there you are. All right. Hey, that was works. intense, man. That was like clicking and moving a mouse around, and I was just <laughs> lost. All right, so <laughs> why don't you tell us uh, where you, how, how it all started? I mean, um, there's all types of different scenarios that people explain. What's yours? Well, it started from the age, for me, from the age of two. And uh, went up to the age of 10, the ET abductions. I was abducted by two various reptilian uh, species. One, Sharab Invictus, which was a yellowish reptilian, about 12 feet tall. The other one was uh, Black Drowso, was 14 feet tall. And that one was involved with the Armada, reptilian Drowso Armada. So they had a whole Armada beside our Earth space stationed. Um, so that was interesting because for me, I remember them vividly. Like it, it, when I was small, I would used to be afraid of being alone in the dark. That to me, like I was a, a, afraid of being left alone in my bedroom. And this was in the Ukraine. I was born in the Ukraine. So the abduction started there. Um, and this was, I was born in 1985. So when I was two, that would be about... 85, 86, 88, something like that, 1988, if, if my math is correct. Um, so around that time, 88, 89, 1988, 89, that's when the abduction started. Um, and they would used to take me, these two reptilians, and they would put me in underground bases in Europe near the Rostov area. That, that's not in Ukraine, but it's nearby. Um, and they would do genetic experiments on me. Now, now was this a, um, a reptilian-only base, or were there humans involved in this, too? There, there, was, there was humans involved, so it was a military-type base in Europe, near the Rostov area. Uh, they had military presence there until 2010, actually. Um, the underground base is still active. Uh, the, the surface facilities are no longer active, but the underground base is still active to this day. Um, so what happened to me is they would genetically um, tinker around with my DNA. Uh, they ruined my autoimmune system and nervous system, and they injected me with 36,000 nanites, which is nanomaterial technology. Okay. And it basically attacks your nervous system and your blood system right so they the nanites were for definitely to your detriment then and it wasn't like a helpful thing 
<clears throat> no, it was not a helpful thing. It was designed to ruin my health so I would die. But I didn't die. I survived. And um, I went on to live. But I have all kinds of medical conditions which are hard to explain because of these nanites that were in my body. And it was 36,000 of them, and I just got rid of them in 2014. I had an operation done to remove my uterus because that's where the nanites were. And it was causing me to basically bleed out, hemorrhage out. So I had the uterus removed, and the nanites were removed along with the uterus. So why do you think they would go about trying to kill you in this way instead of just outright killing you it had to be subtle because if they just killed me it would be too noticeable or you'd just be missing out of nowhere yeah um if it was subtle it was done on an energetic level as well with the nanite technology because it's very smart technology it's nanomaterial technology that enters your body goes into your bloodstream into your nervous system into your autoimmune system into your brain and basically kills you slowly it's a slow process so and it's you can't with our today's technology you can't um you can't notice the nanites in the bloodstream or in the body our technology like what we have today you, you can't screen for these nanites because they're very small. They're, they're less than microscopic. You can't see them with a microscope in the body. So they're untraceable, basically. So are you sure that w when you had that procedure, they were all removed? I mean, being so small, they didn't travel through your body at all? No, they were in my uterus, basically. And that, that's what was causing the bleed out. Um, and after the uterus and the cervix were removed, I started feeling much better. Uh, the story doesn't end there. I also had Neuralink implants, um, and ocular implants in my brain from the SSP programs. That was done later on to me, right. so I had other um, health issues because of that. So there's multiple things involved here. So now these, dra uh, these reptilians, excuse me, were... Were they involved with the Draco Empire or Dark Fleet in any way? Do you know? Or were they, was it a separate sect of reptilians? I think it was a separate sect of reptilians. Um, because the ones that are involved with the ICC, the Dark Fleet, they're hybrid reptilians. They're human hybrid reptilians. So they could shapeshift, but they look humanoid. These guys were not humanoid at all. So um, straight they, reptile. They were straight reptilians. There was also another uh, guy involved. Um, he was tall, had grayish, kind of black-red hair. Um, his skin was very gray, and he was about 16 feet tall. Um, he was a harvester race type of being. Um, they like to take genetic DNA from um, young children and experiment with it and collect the DNA, collect blood samples. So what I rem remember when I was in these underground bases as a, as a child, I remember kids being chained to the walls and screaming. Mm. So in this, this, um, this harvester race guy, he would just watch the children scream. So he was kind of an observer of all of this going on. He would lead the children into the base and the experiments would start. So I remember that as well. When you said you were in Russia, uh, do you recall um, if, you know, like you were uh, working specifically, like, did it, did it look like it's, you know, at face value that you're being held by government officials, but there are people like working under the false flag of the state or? Uh, well, it was the Soviet Union at that time. So I mostly remember the reptilians and the harvester humanoid looking guy. Mm -hmm. Um I really didn't see anybody else in the base, but I know it was a human-run base because it had all that human technology. It had computers. It had all that stuff. There was also a type of portal room in the underground base where they used to actually um, tinker around with portal technology and time travel, time streaming. And that actually exploded. Hmm. I was in front of it, and it exploded, and somehow they were able to uh, reverse it. So I saw all, all the glass that broke in the room. It reversed itself and 
they put it back together as if the accident Whoa. never happened. Like a time manipulation thing almost? Or? Yes, yes, yes. It was a... It, you know if anybody ever watched Stargate SG-1 or yeah. Stargate Atlantis? Right, big fans. Yeah, it's a favorite topic yeah. on the show. <laughs> it was like that, uh, except a lot more advanced, and it exploded. They did something wrong. The reptilians, they opened ti- Time Gateway Portal through the technology, but it exploded. And they were, uh, I guess, able to go back in time and reverse it. And I saw, I saw all of that happening. It, it happened right in front of me, because I was standing in that room. You think that might have anything to do with the anti-telephone technology that Tony Rodriguez talks about? Maybe, maybe it does. Um, what I know is they have they have the capabilities uh, to reverse time the reptilians and to fix any mistakes that happen because they were able to reverse the, the accident and put everything back together in slow motion. I saw, I saw it being fixed in slow motion, the gateway being rebuilt and the glass explosion being fixed. Like it never happened. Really. I saw it right in front of my eyes. So that's, that's a very recurrent memory that I have. Mm-hmm. It's very vivid and clear of that memory recall. Yeah, that's that's pretty pretty wild. Um, so, now, about how long was it after your ET abduction? You said you were 16. Now, did that continue? It was only 2 to 5, or did it continue up until you were 16 and taken into the secret space programs? It was 2 to 10 that the reptilians abducted me and the harvester race guy, the one that was gray. Um, and then what happened um, in the interim... When I was 12 to 15, um, the Monarch Solutions programs got a hold of me. And um, they, they were training me with psychic. They were trying to train me to, to enhance my psychic, psychic abilities and to make my brain into a supercomputer to try to reconfigure um, both hemispheres of my brain as one working hemisphere instead of two hemispheres. You know how you have your left and right hemisphere Mm -hmm. and they do two two separate things. They were trying to get it so both hemispheres would act as a supercomputer. So I would have augmented psychic abilities more than I already had. Um, I remember being drowned in a sort of um, hot tub somewhere out in the woods in a cabin near the Sierra Madre Mountains um, that's close to New Mexico and Texas, slightly below those areas. Mm -hmm. So I remember that vividly. It was some kind of a forest, and um, they were doing the the training on my brain to to have my um, abilities be even more augmented. They had me opening... um, time travel portals. Um, I remember also two bases with mini CERN technology, um, antimatter. They were doing that kind of testing. So I remember that from 12 to 15, and they were doing that stuff. And I'm sorry if you said this, but that, what geographic location was it? Was it still in Europe at this time? No, this isn't, this is America. Okay. This, this is when I moved to Canada. Um, I had moved to Canada um, so this was in the U- the U.S. because I said um, Sierra Madre Mountains. Oh, okay. Near- I'm sorry. I must. I'm- no, it's okay. Uh, it's near New Mexico in s- somewhat lower than Texas, lower so- than the Texas border. So, um, is that when you initially got involved with remote viewing? Yeah, yeah. They had me doing. They had me practicing seeing images in my brain. Um, remote viewing stuff for them. Uh, that was part of the, um, the brain training with augmenting my hemispheres of the brain to, to make sure I could see things very clearly. Um, and that was the training for the 60 and back quantum leap, quantum leap time travel with the SSP and the ICC. This was a precursor training sort of on earth. So as opposed to, um, and you weren't abducted at this point, correct? I still consider these all of this abductions. Well, I mean, you still, I mean, you went, you went home, right? Yeah, I, yes, I went home. Okay, yes, so definitely. it wasn't, you weren't like brought into the program at the, or the age regression program yet. Not at that point, no, but it's still abduction. Right, no, I, yeah. Um, now, 
what type of things did they have you remote viewing? Did anything stick out as like incredible or strange? Um, they actually had me remote viewing various Stargate portals on the planet. They were very interested in how these Stargate portals work. So they had me looking for these locations. And these are natural made portals that open naturally. Um, it, it's consistent with time sync. So it's, it's contingent on certain time frames when these portals open. So they had me monitoring these portals and telling them where the locations are of the portals. That's what they had me remote viewing. Interesting. Okay, so you said that continued until you were 16. Now, did you have... 15. What? 15? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. It's okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, do you recall ever uh, seeing any like, technology that was used to increase one's ability to remote view? Uh, a few shows ago, we stumbled across a patent for, uh, for a device that was built by this guy named John Quincy St. Clair. And it was this box that you could sit in, and it was supposed to use the geometry of space to enhance one's ability to remote view. And it looked like really simple tech. It looked like it was mostly like wood and mirrors and simple lights. It didn't seem like it was super high tech. Yeah, it was claiming something with the geometry would uh, allow you to focus better or something. And I was wondering... Uh yeah, I don't remember seeing that kind of technology. What I do remember is them them giving me serum drugs to enhance my remote viewing abilities. Mm. What now was that as a shot or pills? Shots. shots. It was shots, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I was given a lot of different shots and drugs to um, enhance my abilities. And not just to remote view, to open Star Gateway portals. To actually open those portals that I remote viewed. So you can and walk through them. Astrally. Not astrally. No, physically so, walk into the portals, so, open them and walk through them. Now, did you, so you would open the portal where you were at, well, where you were remote viewing from? Is what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was like, find the portal, open it up, walk through it, and come out on the other side. And they would record the telemetry as hmm. this was happening. Now, where would you go? That I don't really remember. What I remember is walking through the tunnel portal and ending up somewhere on the other side on the planet on Earth. Oh, okay, so, so you, you went somewhere else on Earth. Yeah, it was on Earth, um, and it was somewhere still out near the um, the Madre Mountains, Sierra Madre Mountains. I remember forests. I remember warm terrain. So, and two bases. I remember two different bases. One was a um, secret weapons facility. The other was a sonar type of a base. So, I was mainly kept in two, those two bases and also the out near that cabin in the woods. So, what did it look like to walk through these uh, portals? It looked like water, like kind of like blue energy. And it felt like it was like wavy, shimmering water. So tunnel? Kind of very much like the Stargate that everybody knows and loves from TV. Sort of, yeah, but a little bit more complex. Like, I could feel the energy. Like, mm -hmm. I could feel the electricity around it. So it was very shimmery, and it, it only, like, took a few minutes to walk through it. So you, you had a continuously walk, or it was like you stepped in, and then it just took a few minutes? I, I had to walk. I had to actually walk through the uh, tunnel through the Stargate portal tunnel. Like I had to walk in it and then I, in f about five minutes I'd come out on the other side. So it wasn't instant like in Stargate. Mm -hmm. It took longer. Now did um, they give you any type of warnings before you walked through about how to walk through or what to do? They gave me, yeah, they did give me a warning to, um, because it was a natural portal, energy portal that I opened up. They, they told me, concentrate on the energy of the portal to sustain it so you don't lose the portal because then you, you'll disappear in the portal and you'll be stuck in nowhere. You won't be able to come back, so that was the warning. Yeah, that definitely wouldn't be fun. No. no yeah. I don't imagine there's a whole lot of air in subspace. <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't be wanting to be stuck somewhere in dark matter or right. 
in between dimensions or worlds because he can end up anywhere. This was a natural made portal, like energetic natural mm -hmm. portal made of energy. It wasn't like a Stargateway portal that's opened with technology. So I had to maintain the sequence of the portal being open because it's just energy. Did it, it was, was it like straining like a mental effort? Like, you know, like in, when you're intenting on something? Yeah, it's like you had to keep the visual and the mental intent going to keep the portal going. So there, there's visualization involved, and you have to keep the energy flowing and going while you're walking through the portal itself, because you're the one that opens it up, and you, you're the one that has to maintain the portal for it to work. So do you feel like this is something that they couldn't do themselves? This is why they were experimenting on you, or could they do readily do this themselves? Um. You have to have a lot of psychic ability and even be an empath and intuitive to do it, to do that type of stuff. So they were looking for specific children or teenagers who could do that and taking them into the, into the Monarch Solutions programs and having them do that and actually recording how you do it. They had video telemetry and audio recording us how we did it to try to figure out how it works so they can copy it and reproduce it technologically. <clears throat> okay, so now you went into Monarch, you were doing the remote viewing, and then at 15, what happens next? I was returned home, and then um, I had a one year of reprieve, um, and then I was taken into the... Um, ICC SSP. So it was I, taken off world. How did that come to be? Um, do you remember when they got you? The abduction experience. Um, what happened after that? Can you? I re I remember ending up on the moon. Um, in Lunar Operations Command, I remember that. Um, and it wasn't a contract, and it wasn't anything official. It was an abduction scenario for sixty years of being an asset. Do you That's what it was do you remember how you got to the moon was it a portal yeah. was it a ship i i believe it was a portal that teleported me there while i was sleeping so you just kind of yeah. woke up and was there yeah i was in a hallway and what i remember is i was looking i ended up in a hallway in a grayish white hallway and i was looking out some sort of a window and i could see the moon I could see the surface features of the moon. Um, the Lunar Operations Command, to me, it, it, it looks different than what other SSP um, whistleblowers have stated it is. It didn't look like a swastika-shaped building that was built on an old Nazi base. To me, it looked totally different. What it was is a bunch of circular buildings attached together, mm -hmm. kind of like dome shapes. And they were kind of grayish white buildings, and there was a lot of different uh, windows, so you could see the moon out from the windows. There was about, I believe, ten stories to these circular buildings, uh, office spaces, meeting rooms. Um, they also had a cordoned off area where there was gardens for recreational purposes, where people could go and sit and just enjoy being out, it felt like nature because there was a lot of plants and even like an atmosphere. It felt, it felt like you were outside. You knew you were in a building, but it felt like you were outside. And there was these bio walls with plants and stuff and birds and water, like little fountains with water streaming uh, down. I've got uh, geographical locations of SSP and ICC bases on Moon and Mars for the audience there to check out. the. Uh, so this is the circular domes you were talking about, um, just so they could see that there. I'd, you would say this is a good approximation. This is from the um, Inside the Secret Space Program's bases and living arrangements. Yeah. I did they have artificial is... gravity in those domes, or did he get to enjoy the lowered lunar gravity and, you know, go bouncing around? No bouncing around, normal walking, so I think they do have artificial gravity. And when when you're outside, actually, you have to wear an environmental suit well, with oh, a yeah. breathing apparatus. Definitely, I wouldn't want to go outside on the moon without a spacesuit. Uh, I was thinking though, if you're in one of the domes, it'd be kind of cool if they had the lesser gravity. I always thought like a uh, playing basketball in in lunar gravity would be a lot of fun. 
No, they didn't have the lesser gravity. It was just normal gravity. <clears throat> now the inside, um, it didn't look like an old military base in- on the inside. It looked uh... no, no. It looked very looked very sleek and modern. You know, like what they build right now with glass buildings. Mm-hmm. You know, these modern architectural structural things. It looked like that. So it didn't didn't look like an old base to me. So you think that they're did you get to see the entire base or was there maybe an area that you didn't get to see that might have been what these other people are describing or did you really get a good look at all of it? I, I got a look at the various uh, offices, business offices and some of the me- meeting areas in the gardens. I didn't get to see all of the um, 10 levels of it because mm-hmm. it is classified you're, there's restrictions where you can go and where you can't. So new recruits, new assets can't go be beyond level five. Okay. Um, but what there also is, is underground facilities. There's the surface space with the 10 levels, and there's also like 40 other levels underground, built out underground where the um, experimental labs are and the true military type stuff. I would bet that's kind of convenient if you build your lab in an old lunar lava tube. If the experiment goes wrong, you can just collapse the lava tube and be done with your problem. I wouldn't be surprised if they do that because there's a lot of various caverns on the moon as well. The moon itself is an artificial type um, hollowed out like a planetoid, and it has world engines, actually. So it's not just a moon. It's an artificially created um, environment. Itself, the moon. Now, did you get to see any of the um, any of that stuff? Because I'm assuming that you know whatever race built that probably isn't around anymore. I don't know. Well, I mean, it's have. Did you get to see any of that old stuff underground, like the I inside remember, of the moon? Yeah, I remember. I remember seeing the world engines, but right, what what happened is they were damaged when the moon was placed around. Earth's orbit like locked in Mm -hmm. so it never changes the orbit it's always in the same place Um, the engine stopped working so I did see the engines but they're damaged so the the moon can't travel anymore out in space their their engines are damaged did you know uh, do you know how those engines work there's crystalline technology there also plasma warp drives so that's how those engines used to work I gotta imagine they're probably pretty big if they're moving the moon around. About, oh yeah. About how they're big would you estimate them to be? Huge, half the size, half of half the size of a planet. Wow. I would say. Yeah, and they're inside the core of the moon, mm-hmm. so you can't see them. They're not visible. They're inside the core of the moon itself. They're like rings. There's three rings. So I reckon you'd have to access it through the tun- uh, tunnels from the surface. Yeah. There's like a core, there's a main core, and there's three rings around the core, the engine spinning. So which faction controls that? Um, no faction controls it now because the engines don't work. So they just don't care about it then? Nobody's Not really. holding the territory? No, the engines don't work. They were damaged. There was There were wars, many wars, galactic mm-hmm. wars, and when the moon was put around Earth about 500,000 years ago, uh, th- those engines were damaged at that time, so they don't work. They're world engines, so before the moon could move around in the galaxy, now it can't, so it's just stationary. Just kind of stuck there. So, yeah. Um, okay, so after you were brought to Lunar, lunar uh, Command, what was the... Uh, what you call the receiving process. I mean, did you um, go through any tests? Did you have to, like, how did they figure out? Did they already know what they wanted you to do? Well, they have records of what I did in Monarch Solutions, and they had records of the reptilian abductions. So what they did is um, psychic testing to test my abilities to see what I'm good at. And that's remote viewing, that's communications, various languages. I have aptitude for learning languages quickly and understanding what I'm learning. I also have a photographic memory and an adiatic memory. So everything I've ever uh, experienced, I remember. So that was um, one of the things that they liked a lot. 
So they're like, we'll put her in communications and encoding and decrypting information. Now, during this period, did you suffer anything that could be considered like trauma-based uh, mind control or anything to I that nature? Um, I didn't suffer anything like that. What I did suffer through was the Neuralink implants. They implanted those. They, they had put in ocular implants, which actually record video and audio in my eyes. They put Neuralink implants also in my head um, to track telemetry where I would teleport on various missions. So they had um, these implants were uh, Neuralink. So there, it's technology and also um, it's implants that are etheric, partially etheric. So a combination of both. And those were implanted by the um, an ICC faction and also three types of different ET groups. Because they're complicated implants. Okay, so they had to have assistance to from yes. ET groups. Yes. <clears throat> now, do you remember, like, maybe what, for lack of better words, what your first gig was as the interpreter? Like, My which... first gig, yeah, that gig was on Mars. What they did, they put me, um, they had me liaising with the two various Mars colonies that still live on Mars, the original Martians. They're kind of humanoid. Some of them are ant-like. Um, there's reptilians. So what they had me do was infiltrate the various uh, Mars factions of those colonists and liaise with them. It's like, hey, cul cultural exchange. You get to meet them. They get to meet you. You know, you're you're gonna um, help them out. Make sure um, they're living okay on the planet. Nothing bad happening to them. Um, I was learning their languages and unknowingly passing back intel information about these colonists. Right. So what was their culture like there, the colonists? You said the original. Now, um, am I to guess that this is an original, like a, that evolved on this planet, or was it just the first colonists of Mars? Some of them were original colonists that, invo that evolved there, and some of them were off-world colonists that came later. So what was, um, what was the culture like of the original Martians? It was very um, it was very advanced. They had portal systems as well. They had trading cities, so they could uh, get off world and travel. And they had a lot of different trading cities on the planet, so they would trade with other species. Well, what kind of stuff were they trading? Ships, uh, technology, medicine. Advanced technology, mostly, mainly. So, so what did these colonists do for food? Did they have, uh, you know, hydroponic labs or whatever? Yes. Or yeah, they had... Agrodomes. So yeah. no, no yeah. replicator, food replicator technology or anything like that? They had, they had that too, but they were mainly the hydroponic and the agrodomes. They did have replicators as well. But they, they, they like to grow the food themselves. And they also had a very spiritual type of um, civilization. So they had pyramids, like uh, healing centers that were pyramid-shaped. Hmm. So the, now the, they just did hydroponics. Was the, is this, can you grow something in the soil of Mars or would it, is it just dead? Right now it's dead because it was damaged by radiation. They they had a lot of nuclear blasts going on on Mars, so it's scarred. Mm -hmm. But before, the soil was very rich, very healthy. Um, it, it, it was plantable before on the surface. So it, now are you talking uh, nuclear blasts in the, in the distant past or is this something more recent? Distant past, about five hundred thousand years ago, during the Galactic Wars. Okay, so did you have any run-ins with the Mars Defense Force while you were stationed there, or was it just um, these colonists? It was the colonists and the ICC. Okay, so group you didn't, that I worked for. They never had you do anything with MDF. No, I no. Okay, so. You'd mentioned, uh, I think I'd read it in some of your, your papers about uh, doing translations for different federations and confederations of ET species. Can you just tell us a little bit about those and what they are, what they do? Sure. So I was mainly stationed on 11 ICC uh, Mars bases that they own. Um, 
part of the work was there and I would be loaned out to other ships, other ET ships. And what I needed to do was take notes, what these species were talking about, what would, what were the meetings, um, and my implants would record all of that. But I also would take notes of the language, like specific letter for one word, you know, how you make the words together, all that stuff. And that would need to be input into the ICC databases interpreted so we would understand their languages of what these ETs speak because there's a lot of them coming in right it's not one species there's a lot of them the ICC trades with many different species Mm -hmm. humanoid ones and species that aren't so humanoid so we wanted all of their languages in our database so we could understand them what they're actually saying without having a translator implant in the brain actually wanted to know their languages and have it all in a database Mm -hmm. and have it understood. So they had me uh, participating in the meetings. I couldn't say anything. I was, it was not in a political role. It was just in an observer witness role, just sitting there and writing everything down, their language, their culture, what the structure is, where they come from, like, and putting that all into the ICC database through my implants. So what kind of stuff were they talking about? Trading, uh, what their cultures are, what they wanted from us. Because Earth, they like the Earth uh, humans. Our culture is rich. We have broad sense of emotions, which some of them don't understand, and it's interesting to them. So they wanted to learn about our culture as well. And, And... The representatives that were there, the human representatives from the ICC and the SSP, they wanted stuff from the ETs as well, like trading stuff. Hmm. So it was like an exchange. You give us this, we'll give you that. I would imagine the reptilians are just angry a lot. I guess it Um, depends on which ones. I wouldn't say they're angry. They're manipulative and calculative. So they're, they're always thinking five steps ahead. And what they can get, and what they want, and how to get it. So it's There's really hard. Like yeah, it's really hard to outsmart them because they have an agenda on on top of an agenda going at all times. Mm-hmm. So you don't, you can't really mess with the reptilians. <laughs> <coughs> well, yeah, and uh, not too long ago, we had a gentleman who came on our show, and he claimed to be a uh, a reptilian. You know, have the soul of a reptilian. Yeah, he said he was incarnated a... as he. At, in a human body. He was but, a draconian walk-in. And uh, he basically made the case, hey, not all of us are so bad. So I, I believe that. They're not all bad. No, They're I got to imagine it would, I mean, I don't have any ex- first-hand experience, but I got to imagine these different ET races would just be like humans. I mean, you've got your whole spectrum of how they are. I mean, I guess yeah. it's possible that maybe one whole alien race could be a certain way. I just doesn't seem like it's very likely. Um, they're not all the same way. They're very different. And one of the memories that I have that's very, um, the, the memory leak that comes through, it's very vivid, is they had me, some of the ET species, they don't like humans coming in into their meetings. They want, they want the, whoever the human coming in, they want you to look like them, the humanoid type ETs. So what they had, the ICC did to me They temporarily changed my genetics to make me look like those ETs. Oh, wow. I had, yeah, I had blue skin, uh, white hair, like up to here, and um, black stripes here on my face. Wow. So, which um, species is that out of curiosity? I'd have to say, I can't remember which species it is, but they were blue. Okay. (laughs) Right on. (laughs) Well, I've heard. About several different blue ETs, so I guess it could be yeah. any number of them. Yeah, they were humanoid, and they were tall, 10 feet tall. Well, speaking of that, uh, about how many, what, what type of ETs would you expect to see at one of these confederation or federation meetings? The blue humanoid. aliens, are they really a thing? I think that's a psychop. <laughs> we'll get to that a little later. Yeah. So it... Anything in particular stick out? Like, um, I mean, you know, I've heard Tony had mentioned something about a fish-like looking person and like a little rat 
type like anything like that like what it was it all just human esque looking the ones that i met were human esque looking i did have um an encounter with the aruna hammerhead shark species very intimidating yeah so it sounds like it would be <laughs> imagine a hammerhead shark the eyes are going like this wow and they're tall they're like very muscular 20 feet tall and you're like <laughs> now do they have to have humanoid. like do they have to have like a uh, reverse diving suit like, <laughs> like no, a fish no. so they're just walking around breathing air yeah they have gills which uh -huh. could breathe air they do need to be in the water but they could temporarily breathe air for about an hour interesting and they like cavern systems cave systems where they could just slink back into the water where mm -hmm. there's water in the caverns so they like to enter underground so I assume they're spacefaring. Unless, they are spacefaring. So, yeah. are their ships like full of water, or how does that work? Uh, they do have water tanks. They have certain areas walled off where it's water tanks where they sleep at night. Yeah, I would but... imagine the crew quarters is just a big pool. <laughs> <laughs> well, they sleep. They they sleep in the water tanks. Okay. Uh, but but they do have special uh, breathing gills which can adjust their air intake. It's just natural gills. It's mm -hmm. part of their natural physiology, so they they don't always need to be in the water. Right, so they adapted to be able to come out of the yeah. water. Like, uh, yeah. I guess that would make them an amphibian. Yeah, or, uh, I guess. Well, I mean, there are fish that can breathe air. Like, uh, yeah. not too long ago, I saw a video, actually, of an octopus hunting on land. So, Oh, uh, yeah, I've seen something like that before. Yeah. And there's... Walking fish that could walk on land for like an hour or two and then jump back into the water. Mm -hmm. So these were hammerhead. They look like hammerhead sharks, and they were blue, blue skin, and eyes here on extended on antennae kind of eyes. So, um, and they were called the Aruna. The species called the Aruna. Hmm. They were kind of intimidating. They were guttural, like they're demanding. So. That's one of the species that really stood out for me because these guys weren't very calm, weren't very centered. They were actually angry that they had to hide themselves in cavern systems and they couldn't show themselves on the surface of the earth. One of those meetings was like that. They were angry that they couldn't walk on the surface of the planet. They're like, why do we have to skulk around? Like... Why can't we just walk openly on the surface of your planet? Mm -hmm. And the SSP personnel had to explain to them, well, because, you know, disclosure hasn't happened for humans yet. So if humans saw you, they would freak out. Yeah, I think I'd be... <laughs> Violence of Prime Directive be, just a little bit. I think I'd be a little bit freaked out. I see the big old hammerhead shark walking down the street. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So they were what they were trying to do is negotiate for for rights to walk on the surface of the planet and not be harassed. Huh. And that's yeah. just be like, no, no, that's not going to happen yeah, right no. now. <laughs> so, uh, before we before we move on, you said that the uh, the ICC was trading. Um, what was their major export? What is the ICC's major? humans see now that's the rumors i've been hearing and i just wanted to see what you had to say about it um now are these like f what you would say what you could call i guess farm raised humans like clones or are these humans abducted from earth what they do is they abduct humans from earth and then they turn them into cyborgs so basically um what happens is the ICC has a lot of various cybernetic labs attached to their bases on Mars. So they take the human and they merge the AI tech, cybernetic tech, with the human. And then you have yourself scouts and ready-made ready soldiers, which you could put into stasis sleep in a pod, in a medical pod, and uh, trade it out to the ET. So at this point, does the human have any remaining self-identity or is it just essentially a unthinking machine at that point well it depends if they want them to have a self-thinking identity they'll leave the soul alone if they don't want the self-thinking thing they could erase part of the human uh, memories mm -hmm. and implant something else 
Or they can even do a soul swap, take the soul of somebody else and put it into the soul of that abducted human and kill off their original soul and do whatever they want with the soul. So when they do that, now the human soul that they remove, is that lost? Does it reincarnate? How does that work? Oh, oh no. What they can do is take the soul from the human body and put it in an electrical field stasis and keep it there for however long they want and they could put it into another body. Well, isn't that quaint? Yes, the Fourth Reich was actually working on that original technology and they um, they made it great and they gave it to the ICC because they perfected the technology and the ICC even did better with that and put the souls into other <laughs> beings. It's incredible. So is... Now, is that how the um, the Monarch Super Soldier program works? No, that's a little that's a little different. They are cybernetically augmented, um, but I think their souls stay intact. They don't do soul swaps, and sometimes they do clones. So when um, say, now I can't remember. Did you say that you were still currently doing ops? I am not right now. Um, my official release from the ICC was in 2014, March 12th. Um, now the 60 and back, it's quantum leap time travel. So um, the way it works is it seems like I say 60 years, and it was 60 years on Mars and the moon and all of it combined together. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Earth years, it could be like 11 years. And in, in their time travel program, it's 60 Okay. So I just wanted to explain how that works. I was officially released in 2014, and they abducted me after that a few times for whatever they needed to put me in missions. Currently, I've, I've told them, I don't give you my permission to do anything with me, so don't come knocking on my door ever. Mm. So no now, thanks. Was this a, they abduct you physically, or was it like a, a consciousness thing? It could be either or. Sometimes they consciously take my soul out of my body and put me in another body, and sometimes it was physical abduction, straight on. Okay. Depends on what they wanted to do with me. All right, so after the after the translation, the, uh, you, the stint, I guess you did 14 or 15 years of that, mm -hmm. then you started getting into what? Um. They, they put me in um, different labs where they were building ships on Mars. Mm -hmm. They had me uh, testing the Neuralink technology, my Neuralink implants with the ship technology that they were building to make sure it worked correctly. So I remember that. And then they stuck me in the cybernetic labs where I would do quality control and check the, the bones, body parts, um, tissue, before the cybernetic augmentation and sync would happen with the human body. That was gross. Um, but they had me do quite a lot of different things. And they also trained me as an assassin to <laughs> kill people. So how did that work? I'm, um, I've heard some stories about, you know, being like an astral assassin, which your remote viewing capabilities. Was that something you were doing or was it just physical? It was physical and the astral stuff. I was very stubborn. I didn't like the training. Um, so what they did is they gave me a lot of combat training, ready combat training. Um, I didn't want to be an assassin, so I was resisting that. Mm -hmm. They, I was not a good asset in that area of the program. I was very stubborn. So they did train me, and I was trained. Uh, I don't remember killing anybody, but the training was brutal and... They also trained me to manipulate others and to be a good liar, to infiltrate um, various human groups and the Mars colonists and to just get them to do stuff. So where were you trained at? Did they train you on, they trained you on Mars? Mars, yeah, in the ICC bases. Did you ever get to travel anywhere else in the solar system or outside of the solar system during any of these missions? They took me on Pluto. They took me outside of the solar system. I actually saw some dark fleet cities. I don't remember which planet that is on. I know it's outside of the solar system. Hmm. Okay, so, all right, we got... Now, you were building... ICC was building ships for Solar Warden and Dark Fleet? 
and also other ET races for trade? Yes. Yeah. Um, I remember in 2000 until 2011, um, ICC was um, re-outfitting the solar warden ships with new hi- hyperdrive engines that uh, had crystalline technology. Because the solar warden ships were old, they couldn't go beyond the speed of light. So the ICC were retrofitting those ships so they could go beyond the speed of light. What did those uh, solar warden ships look like, the uh, older models that were getting retrofitted? Um, Some of the uh, ships looked like fighter jet planes with anti-grav tech attached to them. And they were were space-worthy? Yeah, they were space worthy. Just imagine if, you know, it's a it's a jet, but it has anti-gravity engines and the plating on the hull of the jet is almost impenetrable. <laughs> well, what type of weaponry did they uh did they carry? Was it plasma weapons or was it bullets? Plasma. Plasma. So Solar Warden was using definitely using plasma weapons. Uh they had At least in the had ships you saw. Yeah, they had nukes as well. Oh, huh. lovely. They had nukes and the plasma weapons. So there was, were, were those like low-yield nukes or were they, you know... Like city busters? It, de- uh, it depends. If it's, a, uh, if it's a jet, then it's a low-yield nuke. If it's a um, scouting ship with 20 or 40 crew, high-yield nukes. Wow. Um, you you said they were refitting the drives on these things. Uh, do they have uh, point-to-point travel technology yet? Um, explain point-to-point. Like yeah. you disappear from one place and instantaneously reappear somewhere else. No, they didn't have that. That's why the um, the drives were updated, so they could do that. Now, did the ICC have anything like that? Yeah, the ICC has had it for almost 60 years now. They've had that tech. So now you said they also were building dark fleet vessels. Was that something they incorporated into those ships? Uh, dark fleet ships, yeah, they're huge. They're like our, they're almost like Armada ships, hmm. long ships. Uh, have you ever watched Killjoys? That show? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I watched uh, some of it. Well, you know the, that program with the uh, green goo, those agents. You know those huge ships. Okay, yeah. Killjoys? I know what you're talking about. Like that. Dark Fleet. That's kind of disclosing Dark Fleet. Right. Yeah, and well, that... yeah, it, there's so much stuff that that I see in sci-fi that I think is soft disclosure that comes out in drips and drabs. A little mm-hmm. bit here, a little bit there. Well, what the, um, what the Dark Fleet has, they have long cigar, circular cigar ships. Mm-hmm. They have those as well, and they have like what looks like pumpkin-ish um, Star Wars, those mm-hmm. types of ships, you know, the Death Stars, like that. Spherical bodies. No. Yeah, and mm. triangular, like long triangular. I've type. seen a, a TR-3B over Newport News um, a couple times, and there have been lots of reports of them around here. Um, I mean, you know, Newport News shipbuildings is, for the most part... Uh, Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics and BAE Systems. So, I mean, those are, you know, all known companies that have contributed to Dark Fleet. Yeah, uh, Lockheed, Martin, um, Douglas, you name it, they've done it. I've seen the TR-3Bs hovering above my house consecutively since November of 2016. Um, And I have a lot of pictures of it. because what they do is they monitor the assets that they had. They like to monitor them and let them know, hey, we're still watching you. We're above your house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I saw mine over uh, 64, uh, near uh, 64 and Jake Clyde, Newport That's the News. interstate over here, the interstate mm-hmm. highway. Okay, so oh, we are coming up on the break, though. So when we get back, I'd like to get a little bit into, um, I know we didn't really get to cover much of your story, which I'm sure could probably take hours and hours, but when we get back, I'd like to talk a little bit about when you first came out and the stuff that happened between you and Corey and your experience with the Blue Avians and uh, oh, yeah. that's, all, that's, all that stuff. That was interesting, Psychops. Yeah. Alright, well, um, we're gonna go, go ahead and hit the break and uh, 
we'll see you in about uh, eight or nine minutes. All righty. Uh, you can just stay on there, and we'll uh, take care of the rest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Where'd it go? Thought they would follow us.